welcome to you all this morning. It's lovely to be able to gather together with you. Uh, welcome to all of us present right now and those who are watching later online or on Facebook or even on the DVD that we're continuing to burn each week and deliver to a few of our congregations so they can stay in touch with these services. I invite you just to listen to these words of reflection and invitation as we gather together this morning. You call us, Lord, wanderer of seashores and sidewalks, inviting us to sail out of our smug harbours into the uncharted waters of faith. To wander off from our predictable paths, to follow you into the unpredictable footsteps of the kingdom to leave the comfort of our homes and accompany you into the uncomfortable neighbourhoods we usually avoid. As we wait in our simple, sometimes crazy, constantly uncertain lives, speak to us, spirit of grace, of that hope which is our anchor, that peace which is our rock, and of that grace which is our refuge. I found those words this week as I was looking at the theme of the service and it picks up, there's some lovely words in it, peace, rock, anchor. These are some of the themes that Lorraine picked up last week when we reflected on being in a storm and, and having Jesus still things. But did you notice some of those less comfortable words like uncharted, unpredictable, uncomfortable? Today, Kanini is going to challenge us with some of these ideas in her message. Let's pray. God of peace, comfort and refuge. God of disruption and calling and challenge. We gather before you this morning in the presence of each other and ask you to guide our hearts and minds as we worship you. Amen. We're going to have a time of praise now. I've chosen two well-known songs for us to enjoy. Sing along if you'd like to at home. Um, and as we on who God is and what he is to us, let's praise him now. Mm. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name, your name. Is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to save but your name.
beautiful words and beautiful um, praise this morning when we think about where we're at we can still say I will sing of the goodness of God we're going to come to a time of prayer now um, and I'd like us to um, pray quite broadly this morning for ourselves and our own situation but also for our neighborhood and our world and as we do this I'm actually going to use the Lord's Prayer as our structure this morning we spent a whole series last year looking at the Lord's Prayer it's a beautiful model of prayer we're going to use it this morning and so Tony will read the prayer and there'll be pauses for you to pray silently about the things that it suggests and I will read those little words of instructions and then we'll have a pause and then we'll move on to the next phrase um, at one point there's an invitation to share with someone beside you at you can, uh, if there's someone with you and you'd like to, please do so. But again, you might just need to name them silently before the Lord. But let's turn our hearts to prayer this morning using the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We've sung songs of praise. Let's lift our prayers of praise now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I invite you to pray now for our world, for the situations that need more of God's will and God's reign. Give us today our daily bread. It's a chance to think about what we need, not want, but need, need today from God's providing. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I invite you now to make your confessions, the things we've done wrong and the things we need to forgive. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You can invite God's spirit again into us for leading and purification. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's time for our interview now. And we heard from Matt last week. There he is. Good morning. And Matt, we'll 
you can unmute yourself and we will hear from you and your chosen interviewee. Yes, good morning all and good morning, Rob. Good morning, Matt. How are you traveling? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. How are you? Good. Yeah, good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. So we'll start off. If all the restrictions were lifted, what is the one thing you would want to do? Mm, good question. I think there's a lot of stuff about hanging out with people, but, um, you know, family and friends. But I think one thing I miss is um, playing a band and um, it's something we haven't been able to do for quite a while. And yeah, it's something special about playing music with other people. Very good. No doubt your uh, days have changed a lot more than just everyone else's. Yes. With, um, some fairly big changes. Um, how are your days spent now? That's a good question. Um, so at the moment, I, I work as an engineer. Um, so for four to five days a week, depending, I've been taking a bit of leave off recently because um, of the birth of our son, um, but I've been working from home. Um, and I'll try and go for a walk in the morning. And then a lot of time spent um, cooking and cleaning and trying to help out Shell and um, yeah, just hang, hanging in there, I guess. Um, and yeah, making quite a bit of bread at the moment. It's been another way I've been using uh, my time at home. Cool. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people are exploring bread. I think it's, it's become quite popular. Yep. So well done. <laughs> there we are, yep. I certainly love eating bread, but I haven't personally uh, started making my own yet. Now, what are you passionate about? Um, yeah, good one. I think um, I was sort of thinking about a few different things. I think Jonathan actually mentioned this when he he spoke. I think in summary, I'm, I'm passionate about learning. Um, and like my parents are both teachers. Um, I sort of come from a sort of family of educators, I guess. Um, so it's, it's sort of learning and that comes through work, it comes through you know, trying to read books or explore different music or trying to get better at cooking or I play a lot of chess actually and trying to get better at that. Um, so yeah, I think that's something I'm, I'm passionate about. Very cool. Uh, how do you take Jesus into your week? Yeah, good, good one. Um, I think trying to, trying to come to church on Sundays is, is a big part of that. Um, I think in terms of Working from home, one thing that's been nice is being able to um, have a bit more time um, before meals to pray with Shell about things we're happy for um, and thankful for and, and people to, to think of and pray for. Um, and another kind of thing that started during lockdown, I was sort of starting to eat a bit more. So I started doing fasting in the morning. Um, so I won't eat up until midday. Um, that was just originally just about... Um, making sure I don't pack on the kilos. Um, but I've sort of been able to see it as an opportunity to, um, in the morning, think about God when you're hungry um, as a bit more of a, a discipline that comes with that. Cool. Thanks for that. And how can we pray for you? Yeah, good one. Um, I think uh, probably two things. Um, I think to be a good, um, to, to try and be a good, good parent, um, to Josh at the moment um, and support Michelle as well um, is is a big is a big thing a big change and then another thing um, I guess would just be I've been working at home um, from the screen for you know months now um, uh, just trying to stay engaged um, with work which you mm. know we'll be working from home for quite a while now I'm sure yeah okay thanks for that Rob um, I'll pray for you now yes, thanks. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you for um, this opportunity that we've all had to be interviewed and to interview others and to find out about each other and that we can all learn more and also pray for um, the people in our community. And thank you this morning for uh, Rob, Lord, and thank you so much for um, his spirit of learning, but also giving. I thank you, Lord, that in this time of change, um, he's chosen to actively seek you in new ways. And I thank you, Lord, for the fasting. And I pray that each morning, Lord, that as he fasts, you will speak to him, lead him, guide him, and tell him what you want from him for the day. Lord, for his role as a new father, um, I thank you so much for that. And I pray that you will uh, empower him and strengthen him. And Lord, as he's 
<laughs> weak in the morning for not eating. Lord, I pray that your strength will be more evident in that role. And as well as that for being a husband as well, Lord, that he can be um, the support and the godly man that you need him to be in that situation. Lord, I, I know that we're all struggling a bit with elements of work, particularly those people who do spend time in front of screens all day. Uh, I pray that you will uh, give Rob the rest he needs on his days off to recover and help him to remain engaged and passionate about what he does and remain a good influence um, in that workplace um, despite the screen time fatigue. I pray these prayers in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Let's come to our Bible readings this morning. This morning, we're going to show a video as the first part of the Bible reading, and then Judy's going to read us the second part. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. We've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word. brother and the baptizer <laughs> you are the lamb of god yes i am depart from me i am a sinful man you don't know who i am the things i've done don't be afraid simon i'm sorry we, we've waited for you for so long we believe but my faith how sorry Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do.
follow me. You as well. Yes, you, James and John, come, follow me. I'll take the fish into market and settle up Simon's death. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> We've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> go, now. So the reading is from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, the disciples were all together in one place. And Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the crowd. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3000 souls. Thanks, Judy. We're gonna hand over to Kanini now for our message. And I'd like to pray for her before we do so. Lord, thank you for Kanini's willingness to share your message with us this morning. Thank you for this message you've placed on her heart. And I pray that you would be in her speaking and in our listening as we hear what you have for us this morning. Amen. Good morning, church, and welcome to my office. It's a bathroom. Please excuse that, but out there it's chaos. Um, so today we continue with um, stories to recovery, Paul's series for this period of transition from, not from, but through the different phases of living with a coronavirus. And if you remember, Paul described the liminal space as the in-between, not there, not where we were and not where we ought to be. So it's a time of transition. And today I will share a story about a time of transition for me, a period of being in the liminal space and how uh, the story of Peter, the Peter's call spoke to me during that period. And I've titled my message, Obedience in the Liminal Space, because it's uncomfortable to be in the liminal space. And often the last thing we want to do is obey because we want comfort. And so uh, there are, I will share some characters in my story. So these are the characters in my story. There's Peter the Apostle, you've seen the video. There's Tim the missionary, that's my husband. And there's myself the relaxant missionary wife, and money, because money always finds a way into nearly everything. And fish, lots of fish, we saw some fish and 3,000 people. And at the center of the story is Jehovah God, and I use that name of God because I feel like when I say Jesus, I can cozy up to Jesus, he's my mediator, he's my brother, uh, he's my intercessor, but there's finality and authority in the name Jehovah, and 
it invokes reverence. It calls me to reverence. And I feel like when I'm in that presence of Jehovah God, I, I obey. I do not negotiate. I obey. And so um, my story starts in 2009 when, when I met him in that environment where I met him in Colorado Springs. I also met another man who was around our stage of life right now, which is young family, young professionals. And he said to me, you know, I believe I've been called to, to be a missionary in Uganda, um, but my wife doesn't believe she's been called to Uganda. So there's a bit of conflict. I'm waiting for my wife to be called and then we can go to Uganda together. And I, I was 24, fresh from the village, very patriarchal. So I, I said to myself, I didn't, I didn't tell him this, but I said to myself, what's wrong with you, dude? You are the husband. Just pack your bags, go to Uganda. The wife will follow. The wife always follows. Um, because that's, that's, that's what happens in the village. I thought that's what happens everywhere. And then it came my turn in 2000 and in 2016, when Tim finished his PhD, he decided that he believed it's God's call for him to devote more work, more time into full-time ministry. Up to that time, we were part-time ministry, part-time working, part-time study. And I was perfectly comfortable with that. But full-time ministry, no. Nah. And I didn't know why it was so uncomfortable. So I tried talking to Tim, but I couldn't articulate why it was such a bad idea in my mind. And so I couldn't convince him because I couldn't articulate that. And that was for six months. After six months, I wasn't get, getting through to Tim. So I started talking to God. And I talked to God for almost another six months. And the conversations were always, it is so uncomfortable. It is so uncomfortable. It is so uncomfortable. And I didn't realize why it was uncomfortable until one time. Um, that I realized that It's about the way I grew up. I grew up poor and I was told you need an education. That's the only way to stop being poor. And so when you grow up poor, you depended on people's kindnesses a lot. And I didn't like that feeling of being indebted to people. And when you're a missionary, you're on gift income. And that, that was a discomfort. It wasn't um, that we wouldn't have enough money. It was that money would be coming from other sources apart from corporate and uh, employment. And I felt like that chance to make money was being taken away from me. And, and that feeling of being always indebted was, was what I'd worked so hard in my education to get away from. And then it was gonna be, I was going to be immersed into that for the rest of my life. So that is why it was so uncomfortable. And it took me a long time to realize that. And I couldn't articulate that to Tim. And so that's what I was talking to God about, how uncomfortable I am. So I came up with some emotions that you might feel in the liminal space, which is uh, that space of discomfort, of wishing for something, longing for something. And these are some of um, emotions you might have felt. I certainly felt this. It could be job loss or transitioning through um, a new state, like being a new parent or waiting for a baby. And I felt frustrated. I felt uncertain. I felt anxious that Tim will continue in full-time ministry or that he wouldn't um, uh, listen to my ideas. I was hopeful. I was very sad because I had lost um, that money-making capacity. But I was also sad because I realized that I was told my education was to make money, to get employment, and now it wasn't. So what was the purpose? I felt like I was wasting that. And I know this is about him being in full-time ministry, but in the kind so of- So we, we had finished with a screenshot. These are the, uh, my emotions. And in the midst of that, God was uh, asking me to, to obey. And I found it very difficult. And one time I was, um, I was washing dishes and I was talking to God and I was telling him how uncomfortable I feel. And that's a word that I was using most of the time. And I was trying, to, I was saying, God, I can't live like this in this discomfort for the rest of my life. You had better talk to that guy and, and show him that being in science is just a good thing. And then there was this counter thought 
uh, that I have not called you to be comfortable. I have called you to obey. And in the presence of Jehovah God, when you hear that, there is no comeback. It's just, wow, I have been so wrong. I've been so short-sighted. I've been so um, focused on my, my own comfort and um, lost sight of what God is asking me to do. Um, and so I got into a point where I was comfortable after, after this period, after this conversation with God, I was comfortable to be in full-time ministry. I was comfortable with the institution. Um, and God reminded me of this verse in Micah 6, 8, which says, um, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does God require of you, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And it was that part of walking humbly with your God that caught my attention. And we'll uh, save this verse, we'll come back to it later towards the end of the, uh, the message. And soon after that, I was listening to a message on the calling of Peter and it wasn't what the message said. Actually, I didn't listen to the message because I, I, I went away. I got captivated by the call of Peter and, and what happened afterwards. And ruminating on the call of Peter, I realized that, uh, you, you watch that, I, I realized that faithful obedience is what he did when he was in that presence, when he recognized who Jesus was, that faithful obedience is what he did. Now, for a lot of us, when we are undertaking a project, we want the game plan, we want time frames, we want the budget, we want clarity, we want to see the end from the beginning before we can get started. But in kingdom business, we need to trust, and that is all. And I realized that to obey God, we must know him and we must trust him. And I, I thought that trusting God is the first aspect of obeying him, of knowing him. And in Peter's situation, he, he was tired, he had had a rough night, he was very discouraged, and he was told, cast the nets. And you could see some resistance there that, you know, we've done this already, but he chose to trust Jesus' word. He said, it's your word, so I'll do it. And in that moment of trusting, he got to know Jesus because he trusted. Jesus revealed himself to, to him. And as he saw his power, his majesty, he worshiped because that is the only response when we encounter the presence of God is we worship. And because he got to that point of knowing and worshiping because he had trusted, when he was told, follow me, he didn't think about the game plan. He didn't ask for time frames. He didn't ask for a budget. He didn't talk about what about my life? What will I tell my wife? I'm going to be a nomad now from, the, from one place to another. My whole life is going to change. No, he had trusted, he had known. And because of that, it was very easy to obey. I want to highlight uh, the fact that trusting God is an act of obedience. A lot of times we want God to give us a project or to challenge us to do something out of our comfort, like, like being in full-time ministry, for example. But we, we lose sight of the fact that when God says, trust me, that's a call to obey. It doesn't have to be a big thing that he's asking you to do. And in answering that call of trust that he immerses us into, this cycle of knowing, obeying God and growing close. And you think about the, the um, no, not the patriarchs, just uh, Abraham, when he, he heard the call of God, he didn't know God at the time, but he chose to trust and to obey. And in that process, he got to know God. Um, and as I reflected on Peter's story, I was very encouraged by, um, by Tim, Tim's vision, because what Tim told me was, you know, there are enough people working in science, but not enough people working in the harvest in God's kingdom. And, and that is true. 
Um, and I mean, what Jesus called Peter from was a good thing. And Tim, what Tim was doing inside and was a good thing. So it doesn't mean that every time God calls you to leave something, it's, it's because that whatever he's calling you to leave is detrimental. It's just because that um, sometimes he can see that you can do more than what you were doing at that time. And what's incredible about Peter's story is in that moment, Jesus showed Peter, I can make you a great fisherman. I have that power. I can make you as successful a fisherman as you could ever be. But I've got something bigger for you. And if you respond in obedience, you're going to enter into all that. And I've entrusted Peter's life before and after. And his, his life before was very repetitive, very mundane. Um, but it was a good life. There was, there was nothing bad about it. You know, men, nets, clean fish, stale fish, preserved fish, repeat every day. And there was still capacity in that, in that uh, lifestyle for him to keep trusting God. Um, but Jesus had something greater, something more magnificent for him. And when he responded in obedience, he, he, had, he, he got power and, and strength and grace and anointing to stop working with fish and start working for Christ. And he had that, that uh, verse, uh, that portion of scripture we read earlier of leading 3,000 people to Christ in one sitting. And he received that heavenly download that changed the whole way that the Jewish people thought about salvation. If you remember that sheet of unclean animals that Peter received and was told, get up, kill and eat. And he said, I can't kill and eat what is unclean. And, and the voice told him, do not call what I have made clean, unclean. And after that, he was called to a Gentile's home, Cornelius, and he led them to Christ. And when he returned to Jerusalem, the elders were not very happy with him for having gone to the Gentile's home. But he told them the vision, this is what I received. And that was enough for them to change millennia, two millennia of religious thinking, of um, looking down on the Gentiles because they did not have the promises. And that was incredible. That, that was um, a moment that changed history and um, an extension of what Jesus brought, which is a kingdom of God for everyone. And the Jews got to realize that. And he healed the sick, he restored mobility, he had an epic prison break. He talked to um, religious leaders who were um, a bit hostile because he had the boldness. And he, he raised Dorcas from the dead. And in doing that, he restored hope to the widows. He did so much more than just catching fish and living for fish because he responded in obedience, even though that was um, letting go of a certain way he used to live. And that is a point of this, um, of this section here that every, um, every act of obedience is a reassignment. Uh, Peter was reassigned from being a fisherman to being a fisher of, of men. I mean, yeah, a fisherman to being a fisher of men. And for us, it doesn't have to be being reassigned, you know, from being working in science to being in ministry. It's a little things in everyday life. If you're feeling anxious and Jesus says, trust me, if you choose to obey, that's a reassignment from anxiety to peace. If you're feeling tense or um, disappointed or discouraged and he says, trust me, if you choose to obey, that's being reassigned to despair, into hope, into comfort, into um, communing with God. So every act of obedience is reassignment and there's there's so much power in choosing obedience uh, even when it is difficult and so moving on to to what i learned for myself To what I learned for myself through this liminal space. Um, 
and reflecting on Peter's life was that whatever gifts God gives us are for the use in his service, not to further our own agenda. And for me, that was my education. You see, I, I thought my education was for um, making money, as I said before, and that that had been taken away from me. And that's why it felt like I had invested my life and worked so hard for nothing. And my education cost, you know, for, for you guys here, education is one of those things that is guaranteed. But for me, education costs a lot for my family, for my village, for myself. It costs blood and sweat and tears. And so it was supposed to be used for the very purpose that it was in, I was invested in uh, to lift my family out of poverty by getting a very good job. And, and God said to me, the gifts that he's given me, including my education, and, and for all of us, are for use in his service, not for our own agenda. And we, we like to make our gifts about us about what they can do for us. But God wants us to look beyond that. And I mean, Peter's gifts were transferred from being a fisherman into serving into the kingdom of God. And my education, God helped me realize that, in fact, without my education, I could not be here. I could not be able to communicate with people here. I would still be in the village. And so, giving me that education was part of equipping me to be part of this ministry and to be able to connect with people from various places. And that was very liberating uh, because that sense of loss and sadness was taken away by this, uh, this realization. And that as something else that God told me was that money wasn't anyone's to make, but it's his to give through whatever medium he chooses. For some people it's through corporate employment, for others, it's through gifts. For others, it's through inheritance. It, it doesn't matter how the money comes in. It is God who provides at the end of the day and he's the one that sustains the systems, that sustain the economies and everything is from his hand. He is the source. And so I shouldn't be thinking about making money. I should be thinking about letting God be my source. Uh, and using whatever medium that he chooses. And I should not tell him which medium to use. He uses whatever medium he chooses. The life that he's ordained for each one of us and our, for our response is gratitude, not to question. Um, the, fourth, the third thing was, if we focus on comfort during obedience, we lose sight of grace and the sacrifice that following Christ requires. Now, the, the other problem with comfort is that it also stops us from um, growing, not, not just in our capacity as children of God and what we could build, do to build the kingdom, but even in our personal lives, being comfortable um, doesn't stretch us, it doesn't grow us. And ultimately in the kingdom of God, it decimates the capacity and the power and the grace that we could have access to, um, to be useful in the kingdom and it reminds me of a verse i can't remember where but it says those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs and in this case my idol was my independence my um not wanting to remain indebted to people my, it simply it was a wrong worldview about money and work that was my idol and if i would clung to that i'd have missed out on, on the grace that was available to me um, when I chose to wrestle with God into obedience. And the fourth thing is that God is just. Whatever he asks us into obedience is, um, is fair. And if we ever feel like um, we, God is calling us to do something that is unfair, then we just need to think about his justice and that he is Jehovah God. He is a great God. And if we, we feel we get to a place where we're contending with him, then we need to go back to the Venn diagram. Do we trust God? Do we want to take that leap of faith to trust God so that we can know God and then choose obedience? Um, and to wrap up, we go back to our verse in uh, the, the verse I mentioned before, Micah 6, 8 how God has asked that, shown us what is good and what he requires of us is to 
act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. Now, in our world, we often dedicate a lot of time and resources into the fight for justice in the world, into acts of compassion and mercy, because those are kingdom values and those are important. But just as you overlook trusting God as an act of obedience, we also overlook the humility um, that enables our faithful obedience to God as an aspect of just living. Because whatever he asks, whatever he lead, even if it wasn't what we envisioned, if we respond with obedience, that is aligning ourselves with him and that is just living. And so I, I like to think of just living as living in faithful obedience to God, because he's, he's a source of justice and everything will flow from that relationship, from being um, submitting ourselves to his, his lordship. And so uh, it's good to be engaged in justice and compassion. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but I'm just saying that we should consider or invest as much more energy and um, commitment to faithful obedience to God, whatever he asks, wherever he leads. That is much more important than any acts of mercy or compassion that we could do in the world. And so let us all be mortified at how much comfort you have sought of a faithful obedience to God. And I, I like to think of comfort as um, lack of strife and not strife, lack of struggle, whether physically or mentally, psychologically, emotionally, just chilling. Um, and that is a big, um, I don't want to call it a God, but it's a sort of idol. We, we value comfort too much, whether physical, emotional, we value comfort a lot. And when our comfort is compromised, we always feel as if um, God is not on our side. Let us remember that God has not called us to, to be comfortable. If he gives us comfort in the process of obedience and living for him, that is a bonus. Um, but he's not called us to be comfortable. He's called us to obey. Now, Peter had to leave his comfortable way of life, his predictable life. He had to become a nomad, go from place to place. Uh, he quit his vocation to follow Jesus, to, be in, to live in faithful obedience and submission to, to his Lord. I, I left my, um, my poor, my worldly uh, thinking about money and employment and what it, what it all means. And we are, every day we, we, we need to um, think about things that we need to leave to live in complete humility and obedience to Jehovah God. Um, and again, it may not be something big. It could be an attitude. It could be um, a, a way of life. It could be a way of thinking. It may be a good thing or it may be something detrimental. Peter left a good thing. Uh, I left something that wasn't too good. So it, it could be anything and I'm, I'm going to invite you now to reflect through song about uh, the things that you, you think or you believe God may be calling you to leave so that you can walk in faithful obedience in submission to Jehovah God. Thanks Elizabeth. Thanks, Kanini. If you stop screen sharing, I can put the song up. And I, I really invite you, as Kanini has said, to, to use this song as a reflection. Um, where are you seeking comfort over faithful obedience? Let's invite God to speak to each of us now through the words of this song um, in response to this powerful message.
as we finish you are the god who makes extravagant promises of fidelity and presence and solidarity but too often we forget that your promise comes in the midst of a hard deep call to obedience we pray lord for your grace and mercy that we may believe your promises and respond to your call. Amen. Thanks for joining us today and for sticking through the technical difficulties. We'll have a closing song in a minute and we'll have some morning tea um, and you can get some morning tea and then we'll have some time to chat and share. Um, Tony's just got a little announcement before we have our closing song. I've just got two announcements. One is... Go the Cats. Sorry if you're a Collingwood supporter. Um, the second one's more serious. Um, I just need to let everybody know, those who occasionally, not that we are at the moment, are going into the church, but we've been approached by a group who uh, do supervised visits of children um, with their parent they're not living with, where the government's or the government says or the courts say you have to be supervised to visit your child so we've in in the opening up of the um victorian or melbourne landscape into having five people they're back in business but they can't go to their normal places which are parks and mcdonald's and all that sort of stuff so we they approached us and we have people using the church ad hoc so it's a bit ad hoc so if you if you go into the church it seems like it's going to be mainly Saturdays, Sundays and evenings, but it's very ad hoc. They'll ring me, you know, one day and say, can we book it for tomorrow or the next day? So just be aware if you're up at the church, probably on Saturdays or Sundays at the moment or in the evenings, just be aware there might be a, um, a family up there doing a supervised visit. And, and Elizabeth, I've just got a couple of announcements as well. Um, everybody for your uh, Sunday, um, Sunday the 8th of November would have been when we would have been on our camp. Um, and we want to let you know that we're planning something special on that weekend where we'll probably be in small groups uh, and maybe meeting in parks, depending on what the restrictions allow. So, and also on the Saturday night, we're planning for some sort of social family, maybe all together trivia night. Now, if you would like to be part of helping with that, please let me know um, or Elizabeth know that you want to be involved with that. Also, I don't want to put shivers down anyone's spine, but Christmas isn't far away. 
And leading up to Christmas, we have the season of Advent, which starts on the 29th of November this year. And again, we're planning and thinking of things we can do in this Advent season. So leading up to, uh, and it's going to be unusual, it's going to be different because um, we're all not going to be able to meet together. So um, if you would like to be part of um, thinking about creative ideas for things we can do during Advent, um, please give Elizabeth or myself a call um, because we're trying to um, think about what's going to be an amazing way of doing um, our Christmas pageant day, which we used to always, or the Christmas family service. Um, and one of the ideas is we might shoot a whole lot of little videos of and string together an amazing little Christmas video. That's just one of many creative ideas we're thinking about. So if you're excited about these things, want to get involved, please give myself or Elizabeth a call. Thanks, Paul. All right, so I'm going to play a song now. You can all go and get yourself some morning tea and then come back to have a chat. I've chosen a song that um, is based loosely on another story from Pe about Peter um, and obedience uh, and about the uncomfortable places that we sometimes find ourselves when we do follow God's leading. So you can sit and enjoy it or duck off and get a cup of tea. We'll see you back shortly. See 